Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast, where we explore cutting-edge strategies to keep teams human-centered, drive innovation, and empower you with the tools and insights needed to help your teams excel and thrive in today's rapidly changing world. Your host is Jane Grunewald, a seasoned expert with over 20 years of experience in enhancing team dynamics and innovation. Today, we're thrilled to have Leanne Davey, the teamwork doctor, join us. For over two decades, Leanne has been at the forefront of high performance in teams, from the front lines to the boardroom and across various industries worldwide. Her work with hundreds of teams, including 26 global Fortune 500 companies, has earned her a unique perspective on the challenges teams face and how to solve them. Leanne is a New York Times bestselling author, a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, and has been sought after by media outlets for her productivity, engagement, and leadership development expertise. Have you ever struggled to navigate difficult conversations with your team? If so, this episode is for you. Dane and Leanne dive into addressing the challenge of communication barriers at all levels of an organization, highlighting the necessity of engaging in difficult conversations. This approach facilitates more transparent and effective communication and fosters a culture where issues are openly discussed and resolved. The second key insight shifts focus to the ever-evolving nature of teamwork as they discuss the importance of embracing organic change within teams, celebrating cycles of growth and transition as a path to resilience and innovation. During the third key insight, they'll discuss the critical role of fostering a culture of productive conflict. Here, dissent is tolerated and rewarded, allowing for the rapid identification and addressing of issues without fear. This approach enhances organizations' resilience, illustrating how confronting challenges directly can lead to a stronger, more cohesive team. So, teamwork makes the dream work, and we're here to inspire your next collaborative breakthrough. Gather your team or put on your headphones, and let's dive in together. Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dane Grunewald, CEO of the Huddle 3 Group. And today I'm joined by Leanne Davey. Uh, Leanne is the co-founder of Three Co's. She's the author of The Good Fight, her most recent book, a keynote speaker, a facilitator. And it's going to be fun today uh, talking a lot about hard conversations, the messy people stuff. So uh, welcome to the show, Leanne. Thanks, Dane. I'm very, very excited for this conversation. It's going to be neat. I know Colin Hunter introduced uh, me to your work when he was on the show, and um, I'm personally not great at the messy people stuff. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I do so it every messy. day, but it's messy and it's yeah. hard. And when we're yeah. living busy lives, it's always easy to just keep pushing that tough conversation at the expense to all. Um, so what was it that, that brought you into this sphere of work and research? Yeah. So um, I failed calculus in first year university. That's where it all begins. And needed to find something else to do. With, yeah, <laughs> I needed to find something else to do. Um, I took calculus again in second year, but you know, had to take a few courses and stumbled into industrial organizational psychology. And this would have been 1990. And um, they were just starting to figure out all of the team dynamics that had been um, the root cause of the space shuttle Challenger disaster. And it was just so fascinating to me that um, that there were people in NASA at, at that launch day who knew exactly how vulnerable that the shuttle was. Um, and they couldn't effectively get that message through and stop it from uh, lifting off. Um, and I was just hooked. I was like, oh, there we go. And that was, um, God, 35 years ago. And uh, it, like from that moment, I was never going back. And so I just became fascinated by team dynamics and have spent my life. Uh, so ended up doing a PhD, uh, staying in university for nine years to do that, and then um, going straight into consulting. And so, you know, understanding how teams work, um, the the absolute joys and incredible things that teams are capable of accomplishing and then the the derailers and the trials and tribulations and you know what 30 years later i still still love it every single day it's it's always work right yeah which is great yeah it, it like there is no risk that i am going to be unemployed or unnecessary <laughs> or superfluous at any time in the near future yeah. for sure it's interesting i uh, was talking to a guest the other day and and they were explaining that change is so constant that in a team that might have really good conversational capacity, you know, dealing with the hard conversations, you introduce one new executive or a new product or a new market opening and it 
can turn all of that on its head again. So do, do you tend to see that in your work? Yeah. So, you know, when we use the expression team dynamics, we do it for a reason. It, it is highly dynamic and changing one thing uh, can radically change how the system functions. And, you know, I'm imagining cool YouTuber physics professors who show you stochastic systems or whatever, but, but it's very true in teams. Now, I also, in my, in my earlier book, uh, You First, I talk about why that's a good thing because you don't need to wait to have a better boss. You don't need to wait for a consultant to come in or for the jerk to get fired. You changing how you show up will change your team. So, you know, on the positive side, uh, team dynamics are responsive to you making changes. You have agency. But on the downside, the complexity is just mind blowing because of how any one of these little forces changing um, drastically changes the dynamic of the team. No, that's, I love the way that you use dynamics there. Um, it, it's funny, the the thing that I continue to see in teams, and, and we talked about this before the show, is sometimes teams just hit this like peak performance and it might be a project, it might be a season of the year. And then, yeah. it, and then that same team that was doing great work just kind of drifts or falls apart in, in a different type yeah. of way. So it's, um, you've got to be very intentional about it. You do. And I also, I don't mourn that. So, you know, one of the things I've been saying for a long time is that organizations and teams are organic. Yeah. And life has cycles. And, uh, you know, rather than dreading that or, or mourning it, it's like, let's just understand it and appreciate it. I do a lot of work in Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. and I love to look at the LinkedIn profiles of those folks, because what you see is there are eras and, and times where there's a group of people in a place. So, uh, you know, I just happened to be with a group of people for a long time who started at Silicon Graphics. Uh And there was this cluster of them. And wow, they were making magic there. And then a little bit like a dandelion kind of going to that puffball stage and then going to the wind. Those people from Silicon Graphics landed at places like NVIDIA or, you know, places that have gone on to do miraculous, wonderful things. That's something to celebrate. That's something wonderful. And as humans... We don't need to work in the same place for 40 years. That yeah. sounds dull. So, you know, understanding that we can have a season or an era, uh, Taylor Swift land, we have to use the era's language, <laughs> you know, yeah, you can have an era and that that era can be wonderful, but it is organic and, and it will decay. It, it will, but then it will find new life. And I love that. And so let's kind of celebrate that. And let's actually build organizations and teams that are resilient Mm -hmm. to that, as opposed to constantly fighting it, like trying to keep people forever or trying to keep people engaged past the natural, you know, you've been there seven years, maybe it's time to follow your energy somewhere else. Why do we keep trying to coerce people to stay or so? Yeah, I, I wish we embraced how organic all of this is and can and should be, I think. Seasonality is a cool construct to think of it in. I, I was at a um, conference not so long ago and Heather McGowan spoke about the future of work and the future of teams. And sh- she was talking a lot about not hoarding talent because yeah. hoarding talent is actually bad for an organization and it's bad for the individuals. So mm-hmm. ex- I guess coming to expect and understand that some talent is passing through in a season. Some talent is only um, going to be good for a certain type of project or a certain type of work. And and given that most companies struggle with workforce planning, period, um, yeah. that's a that's a bit of a stretch for a lot of leaders and HR it's a and people huge leaders. Stretch. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then remembering also that regardless of the talent, they're also humans, and yeah. and humans have the energy to do certain things for. A season of their life and then it's okay that the humans want to move on and if we only think of them as talent then we miss that yeah. you know no there's also a natural kind of ebb and flow in in a human's life <laughs> and so um yeah all of it's so fascinating it really is it really is so going right back to that challenger disaster if we sort of dive into some of the the issues there people knew that there was a mechanical problem and they didn't raise it up to the higher ups. 
Yeah. What, what? They tried, I think. They did? If I remember correctly. Yeah, they tried. Um, but, you know, you, you NASA had the same kinds of pressures that organizations have, right? That they had a narrow launch window. If we miss this launch window, we have to push back whatever a month. And yeah. um, it was whatever, 1984, whatever year it was. And, and, you know, the program, the space shuttle program has been immensely expensive. You're in a Republican Reagan government. NASA's trying to, you know, revitalize itself in the 80s after the Apollo years. Yeah. And, you know, somebody just decides, yeah, it's cold, but, you know, it'll be fine. And yeah, so it's not that the small group didn't effectively kind of understand. It's not that the intelligence wasn't there. It was. Yeah. And I don't even think it was that the courage wasn't there. It was that the entire kind of leadership layer shut down the message. It didn't want to hear it. Yeah. And, you know, we can think about, you know, modern parables of horribleness like GE being the exact same story. Yeah. So, you know, there was a great Wall Street Journal article called um, Success Theater Masks the Rot at GE. And I, I ended up writing, you know, how do you combat it if success theater is alive and well in your organization. So these are just things that happen in a system where we have, you know, in that case, publicly traded companies with profound pressure to perform every month and every quarter or political pressures or these things can really cause us to make terrible decisions. So we better be aware of them um, we better make sure we have the right leaders who can handle them because when we don't, um, even a good team dynamics got little hope. That, That's and, scary. And I appreciate you shining light on the fact that the, the technical team had the courage and the knowledge to raise the flag because that is an interesting uh, dynamic that we're exploring in teams right now and a lot of our conversations is if you get the, the hard conversations happening at the team level, how do you replicate that right the way through other teams? You know, you've got cross-functional yeah. teams, you've got leadership. And, and I keep seeing a lot of talk right now around leadership capacity and organizational capacity for these conversations is yeah. how do you approach that or where do you see best practices in that space? Yeah. So I think it's, so the work that I do so much around um, a culture of productive conflict, right? And so few organizations that I go to have a culture of productive conflict. And um, it really can be um, bolstered and strengthened if from the very top, what the leader celebrates is the person who disagrees. Uh, you know, the greatest case example right now is Boeing, right? Yes. How has this happened over and over? over again. Um, Stephen Shedletsky in his book, Speak Up Culture, talks about the Boeing case example, but before this latest rivet disaster. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, who are we celebrating? Who are we calling out? Are we calling out and celebrating the people who are, you know, getting things done on time? Or are we celebrating the person who pushed the big red button, stopped the multi-billion dollar project and said, hey, this is not okay. And of course, we know who we're celebrating in most places. The person who goes along, nods, you know, gets it done, pretends everything's okay. Um, so from the very top, how are we creating systems to promote, reinforce safe places for people to say unpopular things? Yeah. Um, and I think in most people's minds that I talk to, they, they have not delineated between bad news and surprises. And what mm. I talk about a lot is bad news is important and bad news needs to travel fast. Yeah. Um, but what is terrible is surprises. And, and unfortunately, leaders often react to the bad news instead of celebrating. Thank you for me, right? Um, and what they should be reacting to is surprises. Um surprises and saves and heroics and all those things. Yeah. Um, and so it caused me to write an article, one of my favorite article titles ever, Stop Rewarding Arsonists for Putting Out Fires. <laughs> and so what happens is it's the very people who kind of left the dry kindling by the house that we celebrate because somehow their heroics allowed them to put out a fire. Like, 
dude, that was the arsonist. Like, yeah. what are you doing celebrating them? And we celebrate arsonists for putting out fires all the time. All the time. Yeah, I, I don't think all that's the a business I've ever worked in where there wasn't a resident uh, arsonist who was well celebrated. There, yes. And, and who doesn't get celebrated? The poor Joe who just is constantly going around taking, you know, taking dry tinder from yeah. Know, from around trimming back the hedges like these are people who they plan effectively they they make savvy missteps but they don't make sloppy mistakes um you know and like what do we do with those people oh our b players yeah no like what it's it's just it's painful it is painful I w so many arsonists it, it makes me wonder if there's a way i mean you see the way that data and technology is just mushrooming right now there's yeah. there's a lot of companies that are starting to work in the fields of uh like people analytics and i know we've had organizational network analysis for a while i yeah. wonder if there's data out there that can start to pinpoint you know where that arson behavior is happening yeah that'd be so interesting it, it must be coming yeah right it must be coming yeah that would be amazing yeah i bet i bet even in a in a very analog setting if a leadership team got intentional and they said, let's just pause and let's do a 15 minute check in a week as a leadership team and, and ask ourselves where, it, where is the noise coming from in the organization? I wonder if that starts to point them towards, oh, it's so-and-so in this department that's always doing the 911s and jumping to yep. the rescue. Yeah. No, I know. Once I wrote that, a few of my clients were like, oh, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like, oh, um, my, my favorite question, uh, Michael Bungay Stanier asked this question. He asked it of me one time and, and sort of set my life in a spiral for a little while. He said, what are we, what are you pretending isn't true? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, he just, I don't know, we, he had me in this spot where I just, the answer was so obvious to me. I said it out loud and then I was like, damn, now I have to do something about that. And I did. Um, and I think, you know, how do you get, people to ask questions like that what are we pretending isn't true um, it's a great because, question because isn't it wisdom stop question. me in my tracks yeah god yeah um i was not pleased with him for the fact that i had to actually take action based on it once i answered it but anyway that's why i love him but <laughs> uh yeah it was a great example <laughs> it's neat but there's so much we're pretending isn't true in our organizations yeah and this so this concept of um bad news and surprises separating them out celebrating yeah. when when the bad news pops up because at yeah. least you now know what problem you need to solve uh, yeah are there are there when you're working with uh, clients uh workshops or um business practices that that can help in that regard yeah so one of the big ones is i so again, you'll know with the Silicon Valley um, angle, the whole fail fast expression yeah. makes me want to scream. <laughs> um, and like the point is not to fail fast. The point is to learn fast and um, and learn cheap. So uh, with my clients, I insist that they can talk about learning cheap. That's yeah. okay. We can learn cheap uh, or learn fast, but let's stop talking about fail. And the funny thing is, then in the rest of my life where I'm in a more corporate environment, they they hear the cool Silicon Valley kids say fail it. fast. And so they grab it. They say it freaks their entire organization out trying to figure it out. So um, what I say is let's get clear about the difference between a savvy misstep and a sloppy mistake. And if we can proactively talk about the difference between the two and encourage the heck out of savvy missteps, Yeah, right? And savvy missteps are, are planful. They have risk mitigation as a part of them. They have open pre-mortems and post-mortems as ways to help manage risk, like all those things. Um, they have obvious learning and, and iteration and sloppy mistakes are things that um, where it was, you know, either repeating a mistake, uh, it was siloed behavior, um, it was laziness that caused the problem or egos or holding surprises yeah. or and, and they tend to be covered up. And so, you know, the biggest thing I encourage proactively is to have leaders talking about the difference um, so that um, 
you know, we start there. Yeah. Then regardless of whether it was a savvy misstep or a sloppy mistake, bad news has to travel fast. Yes. And you will be you will be much, much, much less um, in the bad books for your sloppy mistake if the bad news travels fast. Yeah. Um, and kind of the worst category is it was a sloppy mistake and um, it ended up creating a surprise that we couldn't manage. Um, so, you know, just opening up that conversation about what's the difference and how do we put systems and processes in place? How do we yep. create culture and behavior around savvy missteps um, is is a big thing I spend time doing. Absolutely. And do you see that when you talk about behavior, do you ever see it show up in a meeting? Like, isn't an agenda item on a meeting? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, you can, so, uh, you know, my mentor, one of my mentors um, always used to talk about noble failures. So in some places where we've had to really push this, we've actually made noble failures an agenda item. So just like some companies have a safety moment at the start of a meeting, you can absolutely have a noble failure. Let's talk about it. You know, what didn't work and why was it the right thing to try? And who do we need to celebrate? And how do we reward them for taking a savvy misstep that helps us move forward and learn cheap and learn fast? Um, so absolutely, you, you know, what you pay attention to is what changes your culture. So if you're trying to promote savvy missteps, you're trying to promote um, risk-taking within your risk appetite, if you walk around asking about savvy missteps and noble failures, you'll get more of them. Yeah. I promise you. But it's not that you're creating them. You're just finding what's there. So that means you're also solving more of them. But you, I think you'll also create them. So, you know, because if somebody, if you ask two or three times and the person has no answer, yeah. And your response is, I'm starting to worry that you're not trying enough, that you're not pushing hard enough, that you're not, right, that sort of thing. They may go out and, and find the place to take appropriate risk because they don't want to a fourth time have to say to you, nope, still playing it safe. I got nothing, <laughs> right? Nope, I'm Mr. Incremental, right? So, yeah. um, it, you know, yes, it will help you find them, see them and learn from them. But I, I suspect it will perpetuate them as well. That, that's a really interesting uh, lens of creating a creating this environment where people can know that they're expected to take risk, but they're given right. safe bounds within which to to do the risk taking. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about one of my other favorite lines. So, permission versus obligation. So, um, I started noticing in in people's language that people started saying, "Look, you have permission to take risks. You yes. got you got permission to take risks." And I didn't have the insight about this until my daughter was in grade three and she uh, signed up for a cross country meet. Uh -huh. And um, that was when we learned that she gets her running ability from her mother, not her father. <laughs> and she came 200 and I don't know, 273rd out of like 290 in the track meet. And then the next fall, the permission form came home for cross country and I signed it and I told her that it was in her backpack. And then a week later, it was still in her backpack. Shocking yeah. that giving her permission to do something she didn't want to do did not work. And I thought that's what we do in organizations all the time. 100%. We give people permission to do something uncomfortable mm -hmm. and they choose not to, <laughs> to take up that liberty. Right? Yeah. And so we have to stop making productive conflict. We have to stop making risk-taking something that people have permission to do. We need people to have an obligation to do that. And so that language shift. So how do we create a conversation that says um, you are obliged to find the ways to grow, iterate, yeah. improve, innovate. Um, and if I keep asking you, you know, where those are, and, and what you've learned and where it didn't work and you have no answer, then that's a performance issue. Yeah. And we just don't. We, we're so in the permission mode and not in the obligation mode. What I like about the way you frame that, Leanne, is that it, it makes it the role of leadership to constantly drive that sort of quest to say, where is the example you can show me? You're not having to tell them, 
go and pick on Bobby in that department and and have that conversation. You're not you're not being that prescriptive. You're just saying bring a conversation to me. So you're almost inviting coaching moments, learning moments yes. in those weekly one to ones or feedback cycles, or literally at the coffee maker, mm-hmm. right? Literally at the coffee maker. If your default question for the next six months yeah. is, "Tell me what you tried that didn't work," yeah, right, yeah, everywhere in the elevator, at the coffee maker, in the two minutes when everyone's joining the Zoom call, if you ask that question every time, you will change the culture of your organization faster than some twenty million dollar giant consulting firm intervention. I guarantee you. I like that. Do you, with that in mind? Do you think that there may ever be a a role in an organization for kind of like a, a coach of sorts that just walks around asking those questions and, and facilitating some of those conversations? So I think it doesn't work if that's what happens broadly, because then mm. everybody knows here comes the coach. If the coach was hired to whisper in the ear of the leaders uh, okay, and to say, you need to share with me what you learned when you asked that question, right? Yeah. And I think that's kind of what my job is and it's probably what your job is, right? Yeah. So if I do it, um, first of all, the accountability then falls to someone outside, which means that it doesn't exist within the person. Yeah. So that doesn't work, right? But if I pay attention to it and the leader knows that I'm right. And they agree and they go, oh, right. Okay. I need to make sure I'm asking that. That can absolutely work. But we don't, and we've done this with so many different aspects of leadership and management is we've outsourced them. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows like employees are smart. Like if you cared about it, you would be doing it, not foisting it on HR. If HR is doing it, it means it's a compliance thing. Box ticking. And it means you don't, Exactly. Yeah. So there's no substitute for the leader actually caring about this, yeah. truly being motivated by it, paying attention to it, looking for it, seeking it out. Um, you can't outsource that. No. But you can um, have a really good, like just like having, you can't, somebody can't exercise for you, but I sure have a really good personal trainer to make sure <laughs> that I'm doing it right. <laughs> that's it. No, that's neat. So that makes perfect sense to me. The leader owns it. They've got a coach coaching them through it, which is a bit of an accountability partner, and they drive the change yeah. through their organization. What happens when it's a leader in the middle of the organization that's running into some of those challenger issues? Are there any um, tips or tricks or approaches that that a leader in the business that is driving hard conversation can use to manage upwards? Yeah, it's so hard. So a few things. Um, tie it to something the leader is on record um, caring about. Mm. So instead of saying, this isn't happening, this is an issue, um, say, look, you know, I know how important it is to you that our productivity goes up in the next quarter. Yeah. Here's the thing I'm seeing and how it's affecting productivity. So number yeah. one, you know, let them express to you what they care about. Yeah. And that becomes the currency. Yeah. And I think often we try and talk leaders into caring about something they don't care about. You're and right. that's not going to work because they're the boss. Yeah. So figure out what they actually care about and you do the work to make the link as to why this thing, if this doesn't change, you don't get the thing you care about. So that one tie to things they're on record as caring about. Yeah. Very important. Um, two, if you're giving feedback to a leader, you have to be super sterile and clinical and good at describing their behavior fully objectively and then sharing subjectively what you see, what you think, what you feel is a result of that. So you can't be judging upward. No. You shouldn't be judging anybody, to be clear. But if you judge upward, you tend to not keep your job very long. Yeah. That's another big one. Um, if there are values or things on the brass plaque that you can allude to, you can say things like, you know, I, I didn't know whether I should tell this to you or not, but given how we have transparency as one of our key values. Here it is. I, I, here it is, right? Yeah. So um, the other thing, last one is if you're going upward, um, leave yourself an out. 
So don't use statements, use questions. Like, what if I were to do this? And so if the leader's reaction is, are you freaking kidding me? If you did that, the whole company would go bankrupt, right? Yeah. And be like, great point. Okay, not that. But if you had just sort of said, I'm doing this, you have no back exit to, yeah. <laughs> to go out. So that's the other thing when you're going upward is, is you know, trial balloon, test, make things, what if kind of statements, um, which allows you to then let them assert their authority if you're kind of blowing it. It's I love the power of the question. We've more yeah. recently been using question storms instead of brainstorms just yes. to say, hey, what are love the that. questions that that we should be thinking about answering rather than let's all answer everything today. And it's, it's, That's awesome. it just I creates a lot of inclusivity and a much broader mindset too. Yeah. That's awesome. Cause we like, how much more research do we need on the fact that brainstorming doesn't work? Yeah, like, true. This is what's frustrating, right? Is that, you know, there's so much research about some of these things and yet it's like, well, you know, there's some awesome pop psychologist or worse, like, I don't know, uh, just like dude with a YouTube channel yeah. who, uh, you know, they, they do it. And so we just keep on with it. It's like, no, no, we know this doesn't work. Can we stop? Can we do something better? And I think question storming is brilliant. It's neat. And actually the more, the more I think about traditional brainstorming, it actually um, continues the lack of hard conversations. Cause really the brainstorm is I'm a leader. I want to get the team somewhat, clued up on what I'm going to roll out anyway. <laughs> and you tend yeah. to see that they're positioning rather than true inquiry. Oh, and and just the room for passive aggressive. So I oh, can't yeah. criticize in the room. Oh, yeah, but I can be so passive aggressive as the minute we're outside the room. It's just like, yeah. And, and just from a diversity perspective, we understand that it's psychologically safer for some people to throw things out in a room than for other people There's just, and on and on yeah. and on. Please stop brainstorming, please. Yeah. No, that's please. a good call to action. Um, <laughs> so a call to inaction. Call to please inaction. Please stop. I like it. On, <sighs> on that second point, no judgment. So I get the no judgment makes total sense, but sometimes as humans, we get quite emotional, we get quite sort of tense about yeah. a point that we're talking about. Any yeah. any tips on how to get rid of that emotional energy when you're approaching one of these hard conversations with a boss? So first of all, I'm totally fine with being emotional about yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't be emotional about the boss. Mm. So, um, you know, if what you feel like is the boss is dismissive. Yeah. Right. Because that's a that's a judgment. Yeah. My boss is so dismissive. So what I'm cool with is you figuring out what did the boss say or do that made me feel that the boss is dismissive? Yeah. Then say that. Yes. So, um, you know, when you said we weren't going to pursue my idea. Yeah. When you spoke over me yeah. when I was raising this issue, like whatever. Super, super, super sterile. The, the whole idea of describing the person's behavior is that they are nodding when you say it. Yep, I did that. Yeah. I'm totally fine with you being completely emotional in the next stage. You know, I felt so exasperated. I worked on this idea for like a week. Yeah. And uh, like, I, I, I just feel like it didn't have an airing and, you know, and then what is the question you can ask back to hand the accountability baton back to the boss yeah. to say something along the lines of, you know, how do I get better aligned with you in the first place so I don't invest a week? Yeah. Or is there an opportunity where this could have an airing before we decide that we're not doing it? So I have no problem with people being emotional. And, and you know, I find our, our workplaces need to be more humanized. Yeah. If that's what you're feeling, it's better to say it, but then realize that it's only your truth. It's not the truth. The boss's reaction to that may be like, that's not what I intended at all. Mm -hmm. I, I actually, I'm going to do it. I just didn't want to spend any time in the meeting talking about it because I've already agreed we're doing it. That's a or big unlock. I, yeah, a huge. Or I talked over you because I'm so excited about this and uh, I'm sorry. Like I, I get that that kind of, power away from you. And I, I, I didn't mean that in the moment. I just was so 
excited, right? Like you may find out their truth is so far from the story you were telling yourself. But the problem is we don't know how to give feedback effectively. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we just judge. You were very dismissive. The boss's reaction to you were very dismissive is not going to be to unlock the truth. No, it's not. It is not, no. right? So when we learn how to give feedback well, and when we are willing to be vulnerable and candid about what we're thinking and feeling and the story we're telling ourselves, then we unlock truth. Yeah. First of all, the boss finds out a new truth that they probably didn't know. Ten to, Tasha Yurik's work suggests that 10 to 15% of people are self-aware. Whoa, 10 to 15 percent. 10 to 15 percent. So yeah. So the boss, I'm going to tell you, there's an 85 percent chance, maybe 90 percent chance, the boss didn't know how you interpreted mm -hmm. their behavior. So when you give feedback properly, you unlock a truth for them. They're like, I had no clue that that's how that felt. But when you actually finish it with a question, when it is actually a dialogue, and you get out of your own way. Yeah you may learn that there was a truth that their truth that you completely ignored and weren't open to. Yeah. So, you know, these kinds of situations where we can actually speak truth to power, but in ways that we get out of this judgmental blame, whatever, and we get to, you know, realizing that the narrator in our head is unreliable mm -hmm. and we need a process to do a better job of validating mm. our unreliable narrator. I like that. And great feedback is like, mm, there you go. So I refer to the little voices in my head as my itty bitty shitty committee because they <laughs> tell me they tell me stories that are usually self-critical. They're usually, because we're humans, they're usually much more negative than what the truth is. And if I listen to the itty bitty shitty committee, instead of actually creating an opportunity to say, here's, here's how that landed with me. Here's what it, what I'm thinking, here's what I'm feeling. Can you please now tell me your version of the story so I can find out, you know? And the my favorite one ever, early in the pandemic, there's a manager who's decided if you don't have your camera on, you're insubordinate. So this, this uh, person on the team, at some point she turns off her camera uh -huh. and the manager tells me afterward, you know, he's very frustrated and she's blah, 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 blah. I said, well, why don't you just tell her what what you're thinking and how it threw you off your game and you were thinking she was disinterested and like don't tell her that but tell her like what was going on because here's the story I was telling myself turned out that um it was early COVID days her kid her grandkid was sick her uh. kids couldn't leave school and all of a sudden she realizes her grandchild is running naked behind her in the screen <laughs> and she's like I was worried about getting put up on child pornography charges huh. that's why I turned off my camera this is this is not the story that the manager was telling. And I oh. just love that because so many times we are telling ourselves stories that have no relationship. They are fiction. Total fiction. Total fiction. So yeah, um, those are messy conversations. When we get good at them, yep. miracles happen. I, and I like that the itty bitty shitty committee's first three letters are, are the same as IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. There's, there's some yes, play there. Yes, and I think... I, I think there is, because I think that the louder your itty bitty shitty committee, the more likely you are to have IBS. I think that's very true. <laughs> There's science the, there. <laughs> well, the the that whole the brain gut. like axis, brain gut axis, like, yep, yeah, I think so. Yeah, all right. We're on to something. We're gonna we're gonna commission. This, this could some be research. the Huberman podcast. We're <laughs> like we're <laughs> I like it. I like it. And and actually not listening to that unreliable sort of internal narrator. It yeah. forces curiosity and yes. and curiosity is one of my favorite words right now because oh, me too. it just solves so many problems. Oh, it, like so many. But the I would say there are few things as endangered in our society right now as curiosity. You're right. Yeah. It, it is uh, like I can't go anywhere. My Instagram feed is not safe. My like nowhere is safe. The news is not safe. Nowhere is safe from incurious people. Yeah. Um, who are just so ready to tell me their truth um, and ram it down my throat. Uh, it is massively problematic in our entire society mm -hmm. at the moment. So yes, when I bump up against a curious, open person, it's it's like you know opening the plane to a 
you know, Caribbean vacation, <laughs> smelling the sea air. You're just like, oh, thank you. I'm restored. <laughs> yeah. No, I like that. I know I, d- I did some work with Craig Weber, who, mm-hmm. um, who'd come down and done some work with my team. And uh, he talked a lot about how curiosity can um, really help those leaders in the room who have a tendency to just kind of say their piece and get moving. And, and, and on the flip side, how yeah. candor can help the, the people who are generally quieter in the room to say their statement, probably going back to some of your best practices in a way that, yeah. you know, is tied to boss's language is sterile, yeah, 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 that yeah. type of thing. The, the challenge, so if I go back to the psychologist in me, right, the challenge is that most management um, best practice or advice just, you know, really misses the importance of individual differences. Mm-hmm. And I think it's where being a psychologist um, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not a registered psychologist, but having a PhD in psychology, it, it really um, changes my perspective. Yeah. And there are people who just are not curious. Yeah. It is not where things go. And so then what we have to teach them is um, we have to proceduralize curiosity. Yeah. And the challenge for them is when they start on that, uh, their team tends to experience that as disingenuous or inauthentic. Like, no, they authentically want to be better as a leader. Yes. And, you know, they may not authentically be curious, but they care enough to learn how to behave in a way. So it really frustrates me when people are like, yeah, you know, that's inauthentic. I'm like, no, what's, you know, what's authentic is how motivated they are to do a better job. Yeah. If it's clumsy and kludgy and they have to learn, please encourage them. Because that's, you know, that's the behavior we want and you can proceduralize it. Yes. So, you know, you can proceduralize candor. There are some people who are naturally very nervous, very anxious, do not feel that it is safe to be candid and you have to teach them and and have, you know, small good experiences that they can build from. So, yeah, you know, we just have to remember that Curiosity is not natural for some people. Candor is not natural for some people, but it's okay to learn and practice and reward small steps in that direction. Absolutely. And I like the way you touched on the word care there too, because when you were role-playing that example of the the team member saying something to their boss about, you know, how they felt dismissed, but but being yeah. objective, the resulting conversation was one of care and of authenticity. Yes. You know, it actually sounded exactly. really refreshing. You as the manager were saying, oh, I had no idea. That wasn't my intention. Like, wouldn't it be yeah. wonderful if we had more conversations like that at work every day? It, You know, and in the places where I work with a team for a year or two years and we really get to that point, yeah. it is, you know, people, I get emails on week. I got an email this weekend from a CEO <laughs> who just was like, okay, I tried it. And it worked. Uh, it, like this is a relationship with a board chair where I said, okay, this is what the chair needs. This is how you need to interact with them so that they can hear it. And it felt really a little bit risky and scary. And and I got the Saturday email of like, it worked. And now we're having the right conversation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, but you really have to get to that point. Um, it takes a long time. You don't just change these mindsets and behaviors and habits quickly. No, And I love the way you proceduralize it for some, because as a leader that likes to try something, it sure is nice when you can walk into a room and say, Hey guys, I'm trying to be more curious here. I'm really busy. And I'm, I'm going to use this really clunky tool with you guys for the next two weeks. Let's just see yes. how it works. That's pretty refreshing. Yeah. And let me know, like, yeah. give me the tweaks yeah. and, and tell me, you know, tell me what I could do better or what worked, or let me know how it landed with you or, you know, I'm, I'm going to, tr- but do that, be vulnerable, go in and say, I know being better at this matters. Mm-hmm. I care about this and I care enough about it to suck at it and keep going <laughs> in public. Uh, yes. <laughs> yep. I, I, yes. I care enough about this to publicly humiliate myself. What I need from you is to have my back here. Yeah. Help me get better at it. But you know, how refreshing to have a leader who says, this matters to me. I care about this. I care enough to suck publicly. That's really caring. It really is. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. 
Look, this has been a, a wonderful conversation, Lee, and I've taken, I think, three pages of summary notes, so it's going to be hard to summarize here, but I loved how we talked about, um, you know, talent is human, so let's remember that it's going to be organic, there's going to be seasons and eras. Um, I love the whole point that you talk around on bad news versus surprises and making sure that we um, celebrate those problems and, and we act quickly uh, in, in bringing the learning forward. I thought that was really cool. The tell me what you tried to do that didn't work is probably my biggest unlock question from today. Like I really want to go out and try that with my team and and become consistent in that because like you said, it creates the obligation. I'm not outsourcing it. It's coming directly from me as a leader. That's super powerful. And and I've got to say that the uh, only 10 to 15% of leaders being self-aware is both frightening, but, but it's also um, a good call to action to be procedural in how we go about creating, you know, hard conversations and and supporting them in our team. So uh, that was my best effort at a summary, but there was so much amazing. more great stuff that you hit on in there. <laughs> amazing, amazing. <laughs> so if any of our uh, listeners want to reach out and find your books, uh, engage with with you and the team at Three Co's, how do they best find you? Yeah, so the website is leannedavy.com. Um, and LinkedIn is a great place. So I refer to my LinkedIn as my LinkedIn couch. And so I'm always trying to strike up controversial conversations and have people come and grab a seat on the couch and engage the comments. There's, there's usually dozens of comments on every post. So either leannedavy.com, there's hundreds of free resources on the website. Awesome. And then uh, if you want to chat, come to LinkedIn, Awesome. sit on my couch. <laughs> well, thank you. This has been action packed and I'm sure our listeners have had a great time. So, uh, Again, I appreciate you taking the time to share your story. My huge pleasure. I had so much fun. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you for joining us. Remember that by embracing vulnerability, trusting our intuition, and approaching challenges with compassion, we not only strengthen our teams, but also pave the way for a future where collaboration thrives. If you're hungry for more insights, strategies, and research on collaboration, head over to thefutureofteamwork.com. There, you can join our mailing list to stay updated with the latest episodes and get access to exclusive content tailored to make your team thrive. Together, we can build the future of teamwork. Until next time.